since that has been Tom's day job all the time he's been associated with the trust and earlier the housing and sheltering committee. He is the executive director of Home City Housing in Springfield. Um, so uh, I know I'm going to miss Tom and I assume everybody else will as well. Um, the town manager has initiated a search for someone, I wouldn't say to replace him, but for a new member. And hopefully we'll get that done um, within the next few weeks. Uh, so uh, obviously Tom hasn't not joining us tonight um, and uh, uh, won't be joining us probably in the future either, except maybe occasionally as a attendee or a visitor. Uh, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to mark that because it, it is a significant change for us, uh, particularly as we're going through the process of looking to procure a new affordable housing development, which we'll talk at, about more later this evening. Are there any other announcements that anybody has? Okay. Uh, Paul, did you have an announcement? Uh, no. Uh, okay, fine. I just saw you pop up, so I was wondering if that meant you had something. Uh, it's just changing headsets. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Nate has put up the agenda. The first item of business is to review minutes from October and November. And uh, uh, so uh, those were sent out. Actually, I think I may have only sent out uh, the November minutes. I think it was just the November, right? Um, I think October, I don't know if, I thought we saw to approve, have to approve those or maybe I'm wrong, but we only have I the November ones right now. We approved those in November, but- October was approved last meeting. Yeah, that's what I meant, November. okay. So we're up to the November minutes. Uh, and I can share those if people would like. I know they were sent around though. Are there questions or comments on the draft? It's pretty detailed. Uh, <laughs> since I, John was okay, okay, Carol. I just had a number of little, little niggly things that don't really change actually exactly the content, but feel like places where words are used wrong or something. And so I don't know whether we have to go through them all or I can somehow send them to somebody, tell me what I need to do. I think if you send it to uh, John and I, um, if you have a marked up copy or something. Yeah, I do. I can do okay. that. And then we don't have to worry about it right now. That's a great idea. I like it. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, if, it, if there's nothing major, then I think that's the best way to handle it. Yeah, it's just like wording things or spelling things or something. So yes, I will do that. Okay. I'll and send then, it to John and John. Right. And then we'll make the changes and... Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, are there any other changes? Okay, then I'm gonna uh, say that the uh, minutes are accepted as presented um, with the uh, exception of the changes that Carol is asking for, which we'll make between now and the formal posting of the minutes. Okay, the next item of business was supposed to be the update on emergency rental assistance program um, but Jana is tied up for the next oh, 20 or 30 minutes. So we'll take that up when she joins us. And instead we're gonna go to item four, which is the update to the housing strategic, housing trust strategic plan. So uh, again, everybody was sent a copy of that and uh, whoops. And it would be helpful. Um, gee, Erica hasn't joined us yet, has she? Right, so. Okay, well, uh, Frida, is Rita with us? 
Um, actually, she might be a call-in listener. Who's on the phone? Yeah, I think that's... Is there, um, are there sections, John, of the, of the plan you'd want to go over or? Yeah, um, basically what we need to review are pages four and five, <laughs> but to be honest, I can't remember exactly which elements are new. I can remember some of them, but I'm not sure I can remember all of them. Uh, so I was hoping one of them would be on the call, uh, on the call right now. Yeah, I think that's read on the call, but I'm not, not seeing anything. So page four. Yeah, if, if we go to the bottom of page four, uh, the word completed has been inserted and that has to do with the next uh, four goals mm -hmm. that are there. So if you go drop down to page five, uh, those four goals are considered to be completed. Uh, Where are we? Can people see this, the, the text of the plan or is that? The uh, first goal is to you know, advocate for the adoption of a town property disposition policy. Uh, the second one is secure transfer of at least one town owned property to the trust for affordable housing, establish funding thresholds and underwriting criteria and foster development redevelopment to create uh, supportive enhanced SRO housing. And we've done all of that. Uh, if anybody has any question about how we did it, I can answer that. Okay, and then the, there's the update is incorporated under the section titled FY 2020 to 2020, 2022. Um, so we are now working on fostering development of a second town owned property and possibly a third or a fourth as well. Um, I think Number six is something we've already been working on. I don't think that's a change. Uh, I don't think uh, seven is something we started working on actually before the pandemic hit and that's been on hold, but we do expect to come back to that. Um, eight, uh, again, is something that we've been doing. Uh, and we'll continue to do this evening. Nine is uh, again, uh, something that we haven't talked about, um, but certainly Erica and Rita both thought that was important for us to begin exploring new uh, revenue sources to try to provide a former financial basis for the trust. So John, Erica has joined us. Oh, okay. She'd been a panelist and then slow to get promoted. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Erica. Hi. Sorry. I At seven o'clock, I have to pick up my husband, so I try to get in as quickly as I can. Okay. That's fine. We're just going over the changes to the uh, strategic plan, and I was trying to point out the things that have changed that we did talk about last time. So we're up to page five, which is where most of the changes are. Correct. And uh, I just mentioned number nine, which is the looking for new revenue sources to put us on a stronger financial footing. Uh, 10 is working on reviewing the town zoning bylaws and updating these, uh, presumably with the goal of encouraging more affordable housing. And 11, is to work with the conservation department. It's to, missing a word. Yeah, to look for opportunities to uh, do some collaboration there where the there either is existing land that might have a piece that could be uh, used for affordable housing or as new pieces of property are acquired for conservation to look for an opportunity uh, to uh, uh, put affordable housing on a piece of that property as well. 
Um, and actually, it's something that I've talked about with Dave Zomek, and uh, I had thought it was part of our strategic plan, but apparently it wasn't. So Rita and Erica have added that. Uh, again, the ongoing uh, list, I think, are for the most part not new. Is there anything new that's there? Oh, no. 12, 13, 14, 15, there isn't. No. Okay, so that's basically what we're voting on. Um, we're voting to add those elements into our plan, and that means committing to work on them in this year and the year ahead. Uh, we haven't talked about doing or creating a multi-year budget, which is something that's later in the document, so we don't have a proposal for that. But again, it's something we might work on in conjunction with number nine, exploring new and existing revenue sources since a multi-year financial plan uh, would include what we wanna spend that money on and should dovetail with our other objectives. So Eric, I, is there anything else you wanted to add to this? Um, I, well, the, the only other thing is just a correction or, or an addition on page 21, where we just sort of uh, updated that the HSC was successfully merged with the trust. We thought that was important uh, and now operates with a nine member board. And even though I don't see it on mine, I thought we fleshed out a little bit the uh, responsibility and the commitment of members to be part of subcommittees and to ensure that new members understood that that's part of their commitment. But that's it. Okay. I thought, could I just say about number eight? I thought I remember talking last time about having this be more general than the COVID pandemic and to take the reference to COVID out. So we were talking about uh, the fact of pandemics kind of in general, although that's the one right now. So maybe I'm looking at the wrong place, but I thought we had talked about changing that a little bit last time. We I did. Um, I think what we said was, um, pandemics or disasters, um, yeah, to make it less, but this one's because it goes all, to, all the way to 2022. I mean, we could have a major natural disaster in the town where half the housing is gone. God forbid. <laughs> so hopefully. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to, but it seems like what we're trying to do is something that is actually maybe not just for this exact moment, but will be useful in other similar kinds of things. So yeah, I agree. It should be the effects of uh, housing crises or emergencies, such as the COVID pandemic. Yes, very good. I like that. Yeah, I think that we sh that should have been added and somehow it didn't get done. So uh, we should add that as well. Mitigate the effects of housing crises or emergencies, such as. Okay. Other comments people have? No, I mean, I, I think we talked, I know we talked about this at um, last meeting. I do think there are a number of um, goals here. So, you know, we, we had a few standing subcommittees and some of them had been meeting, some not. I think, you know, to Erica's point, maybe we have to just discuss how we, you know, would there be a subcommittee or two to work on some of these? Because, you know, in general, if so, you know, some of these things wouldn't get done if if we're only meeting once a month as a group. So. Yeah, I think, I think that, you know, that's a lot. I, I just think, you know, we have traction on a few things, but, uh, you know, I know Rob and I were still talking about the zoning piece. And so no one's that excited to look at zoning, but, you know, Rob and I were going to write a, a, a memo to the planning board or, um, but, you know, even the rental program, we had started that or rental assistance and maybe that can be started again. Yeah, I said I'd try to help with the zoning thing that Nate and Rob are doing. Rob and I were gonna meet at some point and then we had, it's got postponed, but we are still supposed to do that at some point. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Rob has been ill, which is why yeah. he's not here this evening, but he's expecting to recover by next month. Um, so yeah, there are a number of things I think our first step is to adopt this as yes. a change, <laughs> changes to our strategic plan 
and then we need to kind of look around and say, oh. uh, okay, how are we going to uh, make this happen? So I, I just wanted to say that as I was reading through it, I noticed, I can't remember where it is right now, but whatever it's talking about our mission, let me see where it is, where it talks about the board of trustees, it still refers to the select board. So before we actually do it over again or re, re you know, propose it, it seems like we should fix that part too. Yeah. It's, it's wherever it's talking about the board of trustees, it talks about what it's supposed to do relative to the select board. Yep, okay. So we should look for uh, other places and uh, just to make sure that the document is updated. Yeah. And Rita and, or Erica, can you do that with Rita? Yes, yes, I can do that. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Um, and then John, you did mention page 21 or some, another page where there were changes or? Yeah, that's what Erica mentioned. Sorry, sorry everyone, this is not nice on the eyeballs. Right. How is when you get there? <laughs> yeah, but they, I, yeah. I do believe that is Rita on the phone if, if you're able to bring her into the meeting. I think that is her phone number. Yeah, I thought I had allowed her to speak, but I don't know if that, um, that's all I can do is with a call and listener. Now it says talking permitted on the attendee list. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. I don't, I've been here the whole time for whatever reason, I have not been able to, it said the host wouldn't let me in. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. So uh, that's why I called in and I've been listening. Um, John, I think that I had made the, all those corrections. I think maybe the wrong, the original version of the, um, of the strategic plan went out because I had made the changes you guys have just been talking about. Okay, I thought this was the version that you sent me the other day. It highlighted in yellow the changes? No, they aren't. Yeah, so that's not the, yeah. Okay. Rita, can you try rejoining? I, I don't know I, why um, I, I didn't see your name at all. Like times. I'll try again. <laughs> this has been really frustrating. Yeah, I would say on the phone, my computer was freezing earlier on. Okay. Um, but I, I didn't see that you were had joined at all, except for your phone number. Yeah, yeah. Well, I kept trying to join and it said, um, so let me just see if I can do it. And then on page 21, Erica, there's, you know, there's a, uh, a few new, there's some headings, but is there something? Nate. Go ahead, Go ahead Rita. Uh, it's just saying the host has declined your webinar registration. That's interesting. Yeah, I know I I've never- I had to do it a couple of times too before I could get in. But this I've done about five times. I keep trying. So and I don't even know why my webinar registration. I, I don't, I'm not sure what that is. Um, All right. I'll just, <laughs> I guess I'll just stay on the phone. Anyway, I, I think most, I, you know, I've been listening. So um, I think most of the changes are already taken care of. That, that language around COVID, you know, taking COVID out and just talking about, um, you know, pandemics or other emergencies. So, yeah. Could you go to the top of the page just for a quick second, Nate? Yeah, sorry, I was just looking at. Okay. All right, so we'll just wait for Rita's uh, copy. Um, the change that we had proposed is in there, and this on the that's the last sentence of the uh, top paragraph. All right. Yeah, that's so that's the updating that you mentioned earlier. Yep. Nate. Yes. I I did just email you and John the corrected version. So I don't know if you, you know, I think 
almost everything's there, and I thought I had changed that select board language too. Um, right. Yeah, I thought I thought we had done that. So, yeah. um, you know, I guess yeah, I guess as, you know now there would also be a chance for other members of the trust if there are questions or you know we had talked about this previously in terms of those priorities and goals. I don't know if we you know if there's any other discussion we need to have in terms of of those or if we think this is good. I don't want to hold up voting on it or whatever, but I wouldn't mind seeing the version with all the changes in it, mm -hmm. the correct version at some point afterwards, whenever. It doesn't have to hold up things right now, but I would like to see it. Okay, yeah, we'll send it out to everybody. I think we'll do that shortly. And then uh, at our next meeting, we'll take up the question about, okay, what actually are we going to work on next? and what additional subcommittees do we need to form. Um, I'm going to talk about later about uh, forming a subcommittee to work on the request for proposals for the Belchertown Road property. Um, and that could be essentially what we had earlier as a development committee. And that could become a standing committee, but we'll, we can talk about that later. And then at the next meeting, we can talk about what other committees to form or subcommittees to form to look at work on the other priorities. Are there any other comments? Questions? Okay, uh, Nate, can you check and see if Jana is in the waiting room? If not, then we'll proceed to another item. All right, Rita, you try rejoining Rita. I just went to my Zoom account. I, I did uh, about two minutes ago. I'll try again. <laughs> yeah. I don't see um, Jana or anyone from Community Action. I think John, you, I... sent, you had sent out uh, the the numbers, I mean, do, are we still gonna wait? I don't, she, I... Uh, well, I guess we could start going over the numbers then if people have questions about them, um, she'll be available uh, to us. Yeah, she sent me the numbers that I distributed uh, a couple of days ago. So they are current as of a couple of days ago and uh, the way this process moves on they haven't changed a lot. Um, I think it, on the one hand, we need to take a look at those numbers, see what questions we have. But the most important question really for us to act on is, uh, oh, wait a second, sorry, we need to go back. I didn't take a vote on uh, to accept the changes to the strategic plan. So sorry. Uh, Let's go back and let's do a roll call vote on the strategic plan. Uh, I'll go one by one and ask people if they're in favor of changes. Uh, Sid? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Paul? Yes. Will? Yes. Carol? Yes. Uh, Erica? Yes. Francis? Yes. And I'm a yes. So basically that turns out to pass uh, <laughs> unanimously. Okay, thank you. Sorry about having to go back. Okay, so we have new numbers from uh, Janet Tetrault of uh, Community Action. As I said, they're they're not too different from numbers that we've seen in the past, although they do represent some progress. And I think the big question is, uh, do we want to continue this program uh, for at least another three months or possibly longer uh, to see what happens? I will say that uh, I had an email today from the Mass Housing Partnership indicating that uh, Two additional towns have started emergency rental assistance programs 
one was Needham and I can't remember the other one. So uh, it's still a, a major thing and uh, people all over the state continue to see that uh, uh, we need this. The town of Hadley actually had a proposal to create a program like this on its warrant, um, but they lost the quorum at their last town meeting before they could vote on it. And as a consequence, uh, I assume they're not gonna go forward with an emergency rental assistance program. Yeah, John, I think yeah, another question that, um, you know, I think I'd like to ask the trust is would we allow households to who were funded in round one to reapply for round two. So there have been a number of applicants who, you know, receive funding in round one and they they applied again in round two and they were denied. And, you know, we're not spending the money down as fast as I thought we were. So, you know, there's still um, you know, number of applications still pending, but in terms of the number of applicants, I don't think there's enough to to, you know, uh, drain the the resources. So it's something to consider, you know, if we would allow that, uh, you know, there'd be a condition on that second award, but I know that there have been repeat um, applicants. And part of that is, you know, they may have applied to RAF, but I think um, I was talking with a few different property managers. I mean, RAF, I think is telling people it's two to three months until they can hear anything. And so if someone is, you know, in danger of, or if they're falling behind, or if they're in danger of being evicted, waiting three months is not you know, may not help the situation now. So, you know, um, you know, I think that that's one issue. For whatever reason, voucher holders, if they're behind, we allow, we said we'd help them. Um, they could be eligible for the program, but, you know, Jana had said too, not many people are behind on rent. So either those, you know, those tenants aren't applying or, you know, I, I'm always surprised that we're not seeing more, you know, just more numbers of applicants, so. Anyways, that was my one question. Would we allow people to receive a second allotment of funding? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's not that we're not seeing applicants. Uh, between round one and round two, there, we're now right. over 200 applicants quite easily. But I think in terms of approved applications, the total is probably only around 40 so far between round one and round two. There are others that look like they're close to being approved, but at one point, I think we estimated that as many as 60 to 80 households could be served given the amount of money that we set aside. So the question really for me, Nate, is if we allow people to come back and apply for a second uh, opportunity to receive funding, uh, do we mean, does it mean that there may be other households yet to come in that might be cut out if we, uh, if we allow that? I, I really don't know because the numbers, particularly the numbers of approved have been a lot lower than I thought they would be at this point. Right, um, I, I agree. But that I, is I just, I just, um... I pulled up Jana's email so I can share those numbers if anyone wants, if you want to be able to, if that's visible. It's visible, but I have in front of me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just kind of combining it in my head with what I remember from round one. Uh, again, there were over 100 applications in, in round one. Uh, so we're probably up to 210, maybe a little bit higher, 215. Uh, again, we continue to have a significant number of people who are ineligible for one reason or another, or whose applications are denied. And the numbers approved are in round two are still only 11. My recollection is we had around 30 approved in round one. Uh, I don't have that in front of me. Uh, oh, John, uh, John, Paul has his hand raised. Oh, okay. Paul? Um, so I think this is um, a time sensitive issue. And I think we have people who need rental assistance um, who might be facing eviction or looking at eviction proceedings moving forward. 
I think the goal on this fund on these funds is to get it into people's hands. And um, I don't know what the re logic is necessarily in saying you only get one payment versus two payments or three payments. So I would encourage the trust um, that we move forward and, and allow people to, especially since our approval rate is so low um, that we, we the, I think the goal on this is to get the money out the door and into people's hands so they don't suffer housing insecurity. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I, my only reluctance is if there are people out there um, who, uh, who haven't had a chance for whatever reason. Uh, on the other hand, there's been plenty of opportunity to apply. This program has been in operation now since early July. Yeah, I don't, I just don't understand what we're waiting for, what we're, why we're sitting on the money. Yeah, I mean, I think, right, originally, I think we thought there'd be enough that we would, you know, by now we would have actually spent the money or at least have, you know, encumbered it all with tenants and that isn't the case. So, you know, now that it's a rolling application, I agree. I mean, it's been months and we've emailed, like I said, all the landlords, we've contacted them at least two or three times. We've done direct mailings to larger property owners or, you know, properties. Uh, maybe people haven't heard about it, but we've, we've tried to spread the word. Yeah, we've made a significant well, number of other marketing efforts. Mm -hmm. Carol? At one point, we had tried to, to figure out how many months we would give, and we decided to do three. But if somebody reapplies after they already got three months, it must be because they, and they still have to prove they need it. Then all we're really doing is extending it to six months or something for those people who need it, which doesn't really seem to me to be a problem if the need is still there. I keep wondering about if there's anything we can do to make some of this stuff you have to go through to get approved easier. It takes seem to take a long time. And it, I, I'm hoping, I read somewhere that we had agreed that if somebody could just use an affidavit to say, I have COVID related lack of income, if they couldn't prove it by some vast way and so I hope all those things are happening so that we've taken away as many of the possible roadblocks to making this just happen smoothly and quickly as we can yeah. and I agree that it like why not I mean you're not gonna you can't apply again and say well I might need it in the future because I'm already using what you gave me the first time you have to need it and if you need it then why can't you have it well, it sounds like the sentiment is in favor of uh, allowing people to apply a second time for an additional round of funding. Does anybody not think that's a good idea before I kind of put it to the question? Okay, does anyone wanna move that we expand the program so that individuals who have already received one round of funding are eligible for a second round if they can continue to demonstrate need? So moved. Second. Okay, then uh, let's go around and uh, again, take a vote on that. Uh, Francis? Yes. Erica? Yes. Carol? Yes. Will? Yes. Paul? Yes. Sid? Yes. And I'll vote yes as well. Okay, so we have a unanimous vote on that. We have an existing contract with Community Action that I believe ends on December 31st. So uh, we also would need to extend that contract. I think so Jana just, sorry, John, Jana just joined us. Okay, Please. I see. Uh, well, let me just go back for a minute. And Jana, Carol was asking, welcome first, but Carol was just asking about the changes we've made to the program to make it easier for people to apply. Um, so one of the biggest changes, um, we made, which we thought was going to have a bigger impact was moving from the full online application to this pre-application um, so that we could still have an online application, but that we would then be able to 
uh, provide some more, um, you know, help and support getting collecting the rest of the documents. Um, but I think, I mean, I don't know, you can see from the numbers that I still feel like we have quite a few that end up incomplete or in some stage of like document collection. Um, so I'm not sure that it had the impact that we were hoping. Um, I will say that uh, in conversations with um, the agencies that do the raft applications and the raft program, they're having the same kind of issue with about a 15% completion rate. So folks start the application online and then don't finish it. Um, so we're not alone in having this sort of odd dilemma, but um, we really thought that that change was going to make it easier for folks. And it still seems like we get a lot of folks that drop out. Yeah, my impression from talking to people elsewhere in the state is that that same thing has happened in other communities with their own emergency rental assistance program. So I, again, I don't think it's just community actions problem. I agree, it's a general problem um, with all of these programs. Do, do we have any anecdotal evidence why this has happened? Do we know? Is it just can't figure out the documentation? Is it language issues? Is it lack of support in the communities? Do, do, we, do we know anything like that? You know, I don't know. I mean, I can say from the, the 15 incomplete, a lot of those are people who just don't call back. Mm. So, you know, our general, our policy is we call them twice. We send them an email and then we send them a letter saying, we're trying to reach you, please call us back. Um, and I myself have actually done some of those, you know, helping out when the staff had a lot to call and, you know, they don't call back. And I think it could be people realize they don't need, they're not eligible somewhere between filling it out and, you know, getting a call. Um, we, you know, we have a, um, there still haven't been a ton of notices to quit issued. And so I think maybe there's still a little bit of lack mm. of urgency. Um, but I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think we're trying our best to help people with the documentation. I do think that doing things remotely is making it hard. And I think that that is probably also true for the raft agencies, you know, in the old days where you could show up at the office and someone helped you go through your papers and made a photocopy right then and there, um, you know, it was easier. And so it is, I do think COVID and remote, um, you know, we do have the option, people can mail it in, but, you know, mailing things in is also sometimes a barrier for folks. They have to get a stamp, they have to get to the post office. So I think it's a combination of things. Thanks. Yeah. And as we've talked in the past, and particularly I'm thinking about conversations I've had with Jana or a little bit with others, every case is different. Yeah. Unfortunately, there isn't one theme, Sid, that I've heard that runs through anything like a majority of cases. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll also say, um, and I, I know I've said this before, I think to Nate and John, but um, the cases are really complicated. And so I think that, you know, each case is different. Each person has, you know, a different circumstance, a different um, level of documentation about some things. Um, there, there's certainly been some straightforward cases, but a lot of the cases aren't straightforward. Um, and so it, you know, it's just, it takes a long time to sometimes get some of the documents um, and get people to, you know, submit the things back. I know, Jana, the town's heard that sometimes community action takes longer than people think to get back to them. So I don't know if you could speak to that or, you know, how, how soon after a pre-application, you know, what's the time frame for getting back to someone and sending a letter? You know, I, you know, to Sid's point, you know, are people just, you think if they need the money, they would, they would, they would go through the process. So either are they feeling like it's taking too long or, I mean, to me, it seems, it looks like the incomplete and withdrawn are different, right? So you're, you're saying that like a third of the applicants have uh, removed themselves from the applicant, you know, from even being considered, which is, seems really high. Um, yeah, so about uh, 14 
um, basically decide after speaking to the advocate to not move forward with their application. Um, some of that, um, some of those folks are, are uh, so my job is to pull them off the um, online format and um, look at them. Anybody who we consider ineligible, so those are the people who don't live in Amherst or uh, say, no, I don't have a COVID loss of income, I contact directly and the rest of them I upload to our other system for the staff to pick up and call. Um, so there were, there's sometimes I miss a few. So I might miss a student, a household that's a full all full-time students. And so the advocate calls them and then they say, oh no, we're all full-time students. And then they withdraw. Um, some of them uh, I pull off where the COVID reason is not clear. You know, either they, they don't give an answer or their answer is a little bit like, not direct. And so I'll write a note, you know, check, have a conversation about the COVID reason. And then some people withdraw because they, they really, their COVID reason is not, it's not really a reason. And so, um, you know, in all those cases, if the person is behind in their rent, then the staff are making other recommendations of, you know, either their raft or, um, you know, community action has some other funds um, that are not tied to COVID if the person doesn't have a COVID reason that we might be able to help them with. So some of those withdrawn folks end up getting help elsewhere. They just don't get help through Amherst. And I could get you those numbers. So it doesn't look like they just like get tossed aside. Um, I can I can get that information for John. That would be nice to have. Okay. Somehow. Okay, the other important piece of business we have is to extend the contract uh, with community action. This would be a no cost extension. I think if we were to add money to the contract, um, it would require probably a new contract. Is that right, Nate? Uh, say that again, we can, uh, we needed to extend the time and may. We can extend the time, but we cannot add money. That would require a new contract. So you know, up into a certain percentage, we can allow, um, you know, it's like up to about 20% is the maximum allowed for a change order. So if, you know, so there, we can extend the administrative costs of a contract up until a certain point. And then after that, it would have to be a new, you know, whole new process. Okay. So how long can we extend it up till the end of the uh, town fiscal year? There's no, you know, so I think, you know, for trust members, you know, um, this was voted at, out of trust funds. And then we were told that uh, CARES funding could help reimburse this because it qualified as, you know, an unanticipated expense and it was directly addressing uh, the pandemic. However, as of December 31st this year, that stops. And so any, any um, rental assistance that's paid out after December 31st is gonna be drawn from the trust funds. So. You know, John, there's no really, there's no requirement that it has to be spent by a certain time. You know, there's no, you know, it's trust money. So we didn't, you know, it's really the trust decision about when to, you know, to end the program in terms of COVID or other reasons. There's no reason to end it at a certain point. You know, we had said, we thought we were, we were gonna be done by the end of the calendar year. We could say, well, let's try another three months and then revisit it or another two months. I don't, you know, I don't, there's no reason there's no hard deadline. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm inclined to say at least three, if not longer. Um, again, discussion? Anybody have a sense about how long uh, we should extend this? From your agency's point of view, Jana, would it be pretty simple to accept a no cost extension to the contract? Yes. Okay, so you'd be fine with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be fine. Well, I think the impact of COVID is going to be a while. Um, and if we have the money, why not just extend it to the end of the fiscal year? I agree with that. Yeah, so that would be basically six months to the end of June. Okay, I think at this point, then we should vote on extending the contract till the end of June. And uh, 
if money starts to run out before then, we can consider whether or not uh, we have additional money to add to the contract. Um, but that would be a later decision. It's not a decision I think we need to make this evening. So um, uh, is there a motion to extend the community action contract until the end of June? I make a motion to extend the contract to the end of June. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion on this? Okay, then let's, again, let's vote. Uh, let's see. Uh, Erica? Yes. Francis? Yes. Will? Yes. Uh, Carol? Yes. Paul? Yes. Sid? Yes. And I'm also a yes. Okay, so Jana, you got an extra six months uh, whenever the finance people get around to telling you formally. Thank and you. We appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, I, one last question. How are you doing with respect to uh, also referring people to raft? Um, so um, we had a meeting last week with Wayfinders. Um, so just as a little bit of context, I think most of you know raft um, in Hampshire County is administered by Wayfinders, which uh, their main office is in Springfield. RAFT has received a lot of, of funds to help with homeless prevention, um, both related to COVID and not related to COVID. So they, they've had what I call like regular RAFT, which is not COVID related. And then RAFT um, and IRMA that's related to COVID that has a higher benefit level. Um, their uh, community action is what we call a, a CAP agency, a community action program agency. Um, and there's 21 of us throughout the state. And so DHCD has asked CAP agencies to help the raft administering agencies with their backlog of uh, incomplete applications and helping people submit complete applications they have about a 15% completion rate, as I mentioned earlier. So they have a lot of folks that, that submit incomplete applications. So last week we met with Wayfinders to go through the online application and to um, figure out how community action could help applicants um, submit the required documents. That The ap online application is about 18 screens and, um, and asks for documents to be uploaded about six or seven times. And so um, you kind of have to have the documents with you ready to upload. And it is smartphone capable, so you can take a picture of it. Um, but as you might imagine, this is pretty challenging. So the, um, the one thing that we've run into that I'm waiting on Wayfinders to get back to us on is there's about six places for an electronic signature. And so if, because we're all working remotely, if you know I'm helping, John with a uh, raft application and I'm on the phone with John or I'm on zoom with John and I'm the one typing it into the system. When it gets to the place where it asks for John's signature, John's not there. And we tried, we tried, we tested it out a few times with screen sharing and try to see if like, if I make John the host, can he sign it, but it, it doesn't work. So, um, so we ran into that problem where uh, you know, community action without permission from Wayfinders, we're not comfortable signing the person's name um, without explicit permission from Wayfinders that we can do that. And a permission form that would say, you know, I'm allowing, you know, Jana from community action to sign on my behalf. So we're waiting on that piece, um, which Wayfinders seems to be trying to work out. And so I do think that uh, we will be able to help uh, particularly folks. I mean, so for example, from some of the Amherst um, folks that we've already assisted, there's quite a few that owe a lot more money that we were not able to resolve their problem. Um, and so some of those people have already applied for raft and they're, you know, waiting and some of them have not. And so the goal for, you know, for those folks who we, we already have most of their documents already. So for us actually, uploading all that stuff is not hard because we already have it, but we can't sign for them. So we have to figure out how to get the signature to work. Um, 
So uh, we're waiting on that and we're hoping that that's going to work. And then we will be able to offer that assistance to other people. Um, you know, there's a, we're trying to figure out where the best, like the sweet spot is because we can't flood ourselves with people who just want help with raft when we have other things that we have to do. So we're trying to, you know, trying to find a good balance of being able to help. Yeah, I don't know if you heard that. Oh, sorry, Erica. Yeah, um, so in terms of the signature, so I know election boards are pretty tough and they here in Amherst changed my party without me being um, approving it. So what they had me do is literally write something out, take a picture of it and sign it. They can't do that for this. I mean, currently it asks for, it, it actually asks for the head of household and all adult household members to sign off on, I don't know, multiple disclosures and permissions. Um, and so I'm hoping that the resolution could be something like, you know, uh, they develop a form that the head of household can sign that we can then upload that then we can sign for them. Um, it's not designed for a social service agency to help the person with the application. It's designed for the person to do it. Um, but, you know, if you don't already have all of your documents ready to upload, it's, you know, it's, it's cumbersome. The state is, I think, you know, everyone's trying to make a good effort, but it, it's, it's just complicated, more complicated than maybe they hoped it would be. Okay. I'll just close out this discussion. Uh, to mention, Jana, that before I think you came on, we voted to allow individuals who'd already received one round of funding to apply for a second round. That's great <laughs> news. Thank you. Okay, so I think you can implement that tomorrow. <laughs> um, that's excellent news. Thank you. Very, that's great. There's a, there's quite a few people actually that uh, fall into that category, so that would be great. Um, okay, great. good. Thank you. Right. Can I ask one other question? It's a, it's a money question, but if am I correct that if we don't, if the money hasn't actually gone out the door to the client or to the landlord to pay the rent by December 30th, we can't get, we can't get reimbursed by CARES. So even if these things just take a long time, if the person's approved before December 31st, but we haven't spent the money, then it's not eligible for CARES. Is that correct? Correct. So, I mean, we never anticipated that we were going to be reimbursed by care. So if we spent, you know, $90,000 this year, so, you know, that'll be reimbursed, but the remainder of the program would not be. Yeah, you know? I know. I just wondered if it was, if it was the date of the, the money going out the door or the date of the approval. That's all. I was just curious. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, we, we, the housing one, I think we have until mid January or I forget what the date was, but we have some time to actually uh, report on it. So, you know, it could be that, um, you know, if tenants are approved for payments, um, you know, before the end of December and even if the checks cut in January, we still might be able to request reimbursement on that. So I think there is a, you know, kind of a, a forgiveness period. I, I, I read through those requirements, but not closely enough to know. So I agree, right? What if someone finally gets approved and they actually owe for this calendar year, but at some point that it'll just come out of the trust fund. We'll, yeah, we'll yeah. Get Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I just mention one other thing that um, I think Sid has asked me before about languages. Um, so in addition to Spanish, we've also had folks who speak Farsi and Swahili and Korean um, and have all successfully been able to work with them. Uh, with our, We use the language line as our interpreter service, but awesome. so far it's been working fine. Good stuff. Congratulations. That's okay. Great. Thank great. you very much, Jana. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which I thought was important, although I must admit I'm a little concerned about where we are in time because we do have other things on our agenda and only an hour or so left of the meeting. The next piece had to do with additional work that we could do on local eviction prevention. Obviously, the emergency rental assistance was a great step. Um, I've had some contact with what other 
communities are doing. Uh, and as I think I put in my note to everybody, uh, Somerville, although other communities, Boston and Cambridge, I think are doing the same things and probably elsewhere, has taken at least four steps, really not over the last month, but over the last six or eight months. Uh, one was to create a local eviction moratorium, which actually started before the state's eviction moratorium and continues now that the state's moratorium has ended. Uh, a second was uh, creating the Housing Stability Notification Act, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, a third was has been to encourage uh, people to submit the uh, CDC declaration of need to their landlords. And the fourth um, is the Landlord Housing Stability Pledge in which landlords around the state, including some that already operate in Amherst, larger landlords, um, sign a pledge agreeing to do their best to try to avoid eviction, to work with people. In looking over that list and thinking about what Amherst could do, uh, I was concerned that it may not be reasonable to ask the town council or town staff to do all of those things. And so I said to myself, if I could pick one, what would it be? And the one that I chose was the Housing Stability Act, which has been adopted by Somerville. And basically it's a program that requires local landlords when they send a tenant a notice to quit to, quit, to uh, also notify them at the same time about uh, uh, where it is they might be able to get help and uh, uh, who they might go to to represent their rights uh, and a couple of other things that are part of this requirement. If the landlord fails to uh, meet this obligation, then uh, uh, she or he can be fined. Uh, so that's basically what I understand this to be in a nutshell. Um, Nate just put the ordinance up on the screen. It looks like uh, a fairly lengthy document. It's not really that lengthy. About half the document is taken up with definitions and it isn't until you come to the bottom that you come to the what the uh, city of Somerville is requiring of its landlords. Uh, so if Amherst were to do this, it is something that uh, the town council would have to adopt. And the question I'm really opening up for discussion is whether we should recommend that the town council adopt this or uh, adopt any of the other uh, three ideas that I also briefly mentioned before. So we're open for discussion. I think one concern is that I would say is that what would the impact of this be on town staff? Because somebody does have to administer this program. I'm not sure that it requires a lot of administration, but it's not nothing. Uh, so that would be another concern, I think, that we need to consider. I'm sure the town council and the town manager would consider in thinking about whether this should be adopted in Amherst. So the discussion for this is open. Well, in reading it, I would really support this, but I think, you know, as you said before, there's some practical considerations with regard, um, can this be operationalized and how would it be operationalized? But I think this goes beyond COVID. I think it's a, I think it's, it's a practical, important intervention period. Um, and I think if you're going to be a homeowner uh, and you're going to rent, you need to know what your responsibilities are and you should be able to then give those um, rights to your tenant if you're going to proceed with an eviction notice. Um, so, I mean, I, I know that some towns, what they do is they actually do a lot of training with homeowners that rent 
um, out so that they understand what their responsibilities are. But again, the implementation piece of it does have um, responsibilities for staff. And so I think, you know, there's a practicality of it. Can it be done with the resources that Amherst has? But I think on a general basis, I'm all for it. Uh, I would echo Erica there. I, I, I have for those who are more experienced in sort of administration programs like these, is, is there any sense for how onerous this would be on the town to, to implement? Well, a couple of things I'll mention. One is the town of Somerville has a brochure that they asked landlords to distribute. Now the town of Somerville actually designed the brochure and so that's something that we would have to do. Could be us or it could be town, but it's something that we need to give to landlords to distribute to tenants. And as I said, it has the kind of information in, in it that landlords would be required to give. So one thing would be to notify all landlords of this and to uh, make sure that they get copies of what it is they're supposed to distribute to tenants along with the eviction notice. Um, we do have the capacity to do that because we have a residential registration system. So it's not like we're starting from scratch. We have the lists of all landlords. Paul? So I think maybe the first step is to talk to Somerville and see if they find it's effective, if it's useful. I mean, they've had it in effect for a year now. Um, my, you know, it's my former home. And I think it's useful to say, was it worth doing? Because it, it, it's not, as you said, it's not nothing. It's somebody's going to pay attention to it. Then there's a enforcement provision. If you pass a law and you're not going to enforce it, then it's not really a law. So the council will be asking those types of questions, I think. Uh, and we're, uh, you know, and from a staff point of view, we've learned to be very diligent about determining what the staff requirements are because there, there are costs involved for these things. So I think maybe the first step is to call up Somerville and say, did it change behavior in any way? Because yeah. it doesn't make sense if it does, didn't. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Erica had the point of what's the immediacy of something like this. So is it a long-term um, policy or is it something that could help right now with, you know, with COVID and the pandemic? You know, I, I had, you know, I will say I talked to a property manager and even with the eviction pledge, you know, landlords could still give a notice to quit. They just can't actually take action until April 1st. So the irony is that they still can, um, you know, maybe instead of giving a 14 day notice, they'll give a 30 day notice. They can still go through the court proceedings and then, um, you know, the tenant incurs costs and stress and then you know they have until april 1st to remedy it but the process can still happen and so you know i was surprised to learn that it's you know i think it's a the nuance of the pledge and maybe it was you know some trading had to happen for people to sign on to the pledge but i it's somewhat disappointing because i know some landlords are going to be giving eviction notices even though they signed the pledge or had considered doing it so you know my thought is this uh, housing stability act I think could be implemented through the rental registration and it could be a longer term thing. I guess the question is what do, what could happen in the next month or two that could help tenants or homeowners stay housed. And so I don't know, you know, what, you know, it's interesting when we talk about a local eviction program or what, what, you know, is it a policy or is it, you know, is there more outreach we could do? So, you know, I try to let people know that family outreach is available to help tenants and make referrals. And part of the pledge is that they, landlords and property managers would do that. They would make referrals to places. And so I know community legal aid has been trying to get the word out. And so I, you know, are there other things we could do, whether or not it's a policy, but just to make landlords and property owners aware of resources for tenants and themselves. Um, you know, because my thought is if we did propose a policy for the council, it may be referred to another subcommittee and you know, I don't know the timeline for approval of that, but I think there would be a lot of questions. Uh, you know, Paul, you know, had some too, just, you know, so is there, are there other things, you know, my thought would be, are there immediate actions that we could take or recommendations or things we could do? And then, you know, if we think something like this is important, is there ways to have that move forward as well? Well, um, a few responses. First, in response to Paul, 
I have had contact with Ellen Schachter, who's head of the Housing Stability Program in Somerville and is a former legal services attorney. So this is something that she designed. She's been in Somerville for 18 months to two years. I'm not sure exactly. So I can ask the questions that Paul raised of Ellen and see what responses I get. Um, to go back to the point that you just made, Nate, what can we do short of passing this? Um, well, we can look at the Somerville brochure. There's nothing that would prevent us from distributing that to landlords um, without a Housing Stability Act and saying, exactly. when you send people a notice to quit, uh, we would uh, recommend that you also send the, out this information brochure. Uh, and hopefully we have it in a couple of different languages. Uh, and so uh, that's a step we could take short of uh, asking town council to enact something that included uh, provisions for fines and the like. And it's something we could do uh, more or less immediately, I guess, as long as uh, the town manager thought that was a good idea. Since again, it takes staff time. It's not nothing, but it's less than um, implementing the full Housing Stability Act. John, does the town get notified uh, whenever somebody issues a notice to quit to a tenant? No, I don't think so. The, the, that would go through the Housing Court of Western Massachusetts. And does, does the housing court, sorry, go on. Track what's going on there, um, which I don't think is an easy thing to do. Nancy Schroeder and I once did a retrospective analysis of housing court uh, evictions uh, because we were looking at recommending a uh, eviction prevention program uh, like what uh, family Outreach of Amherst does. And so uh, I kind of discovered this database and then Nancy went through it, but it was somewhat painstaking to do. You really needed to go record by record in order to create a count. Uh, so unfortunately, what you're asking for is not readily available. And it would be, would it be too too big an ask to require um, or just nicely ask the landlords that they notify the town when that happens so that at least then we can prepare whatever resources are needed. Or well, yeah. We can distribute the brochure um, without waiting for them to tell us they have an eviction pending. We can just do that immediately once we have it designed. And then that can go out through the rental registration system and uh, then the question is, do we have any way to evaluate that? Or is it just something we put out there and hope that uh, it has some value for people? I'm going to say family outreach through, you know, I'm not sure if it's now it's remote, but they have been attending housing court every Monday through, yes. they have additional funding through block grants. So they'd actually, uh, prior to COVID been, you know, I think it was actually making great strides at getting relationships with the courts and the landlords and attorneys to, you know, um, to work with tenants. And now, you know, I think that's, I know, granted you're already in the eviction process. I know the courts are going to be overwhelmed. So, you know, their first strategy is to ask for mediation or working with the team, but you're already in court at that point. So, yeah, I mean, I think the idea is if, with the Stability Act, my thought is if, if the town can intervene before it actually gets to court. So when, when a notice is issued, you may have time to come up with a plan and then not have it actually go to court. Uh, but you know we don't have that notification process. I think that's a lot to ask of, of the town and landlords. I don't know how landlords would feel about that actually, that they would copy the town every time they send a, a notice to their tenants. But My understanding from talking to people who are involved in this, the judges are not eager to evict. And that's one of the reasons why Francine Rodriguez of Family uh, Outreach uh, of Amherst goes there every Monday. I should also mention that Steve Connor goes there every Monday 
or pretty regularly as well to look for veterans who are at risk of ev eviction in Amherst and the other nine towns that uh, he acts as the uh, veterans administrator for. So there is a presence already in court and uh, uh, this may or may not be helpful to uh, Francine or Steve. Well, um, I guess I can go ahead as I proposed and talk to Ellen Schachter and try to learn a little bit more about what's happened um, since this program has been implemented and what she has to say about uh, evidence that it has had some value in Somerville. Uh, we can also look at the Somerville brochure mm -hmm. and think about how to adapt that uh, almost immediately and, and recommend uh, sending that out as an additional eviction prevention measure. If you talk to Ellen, her husband was a teacher of my kids in elementary. Oh, right. Say hi. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in small town. Yeah, John, I was just writing down a few things we could add, you know, depending on what the Somerville brochure looks like. I mean, we have emailed the landlords twice now I think the last one did have um, information about other, you know, mentioning that there are other local resources. I don't know how specific we were, but I think we could send something pretty quickly through email to the landlords who have registered with the rental program. And we could, you know, we could, you know, make it really clear, provide the hyperlink, I'll just click on it and just, you know, really help them with that. Okay, well, because, I, can, uh, yeah. I can send out the Somerville brochure after this meeting. It didn't occur to me, I don't know why, to do it before the meeting, but uh, I do have access to it. Uh, probably everybody else does too if you go online, but I'll do that task as well. Well, I think, you know, the interesting thing is, is that they did this September 2019 pre-COVID, but I believe they actually instituted uh, an, an eviction moratorium after the governor's expired. No, they had it before, Erica. They, they initiated that moratorium last February or March. I can't remember which. Oh, really? Yes. And actually that was an action that uh, the mayor took in conjunction with his board of health because it, as with the CDC uh, statement, it was conceived of something that was a health measure because if people are evicted, then they're at higher risk of getting COVID because they become homeless or they double up with another family or otherwise put themselves at risk. Okay, well, I'll distribute that to everybody and uh, maybe we can think about uh, how to change that so that it's adapted to Amherst. Probably not too complicated to do that. I, I know when I looked at it, it seemed like it would be pretty straightforward. Okay, any further discussion about that? Okay, I have two other. Oh, John, just one quick question, or hopefully this is a quick question. Um, is, is there a reason why, or, or would you not support an eviction moratorium or proposing an eviction moratorium? Or, or is like, I guess I'm just curious why we wouldn't discuss that as well, or is that just too much to ask or? Well, I, I was, as I said earlier, Will, I didn't want to ask for all four of these things. So I chose one that I thought had both short term and a longer term benefit because it's something would carry through the pandemic. Uh, that's not to say we couldn't propose an eviction moratorium. And I know that I heard informally that at least a couple of town councilors were interested in that. Uh, I don't think it's something the town manager in Amherst could do because he's not empowered in the way that the mayor of Somerville is. Uh, Pat, did you hear anything about people being interested in an eviction moratorium in Amherst? I've heard very little about it. And I'm gonna check in with Evan tomorrow and see what I can discover. Yeah, so I'm not opposed to that, Will. Don't I'm hope not opposed to it, and I'm also, uh, like the idea of the Stability Act. So if I can, now I have to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I think the moratorium, I guess Somerville's, you know, they, they made the case, right? So they had a legal backing or they had what they thought was a defensible reason to enact a, mor a local moratorium. Right. And as I said, it's the health reasons very similar to the CDC moratorium. Right. Yeah, I mean, the landlords are supposed to be, I don't know how many are aware of the CDC moratorium or if they're helping tenants complete that form. Uh, you know, it's, um, you know, it's ending soon anyways, but you know, that was another resource. Yeah, I know from talking to Laura Reichman that they've been encouraging people to do it at mm -hmm. uh, Family Outreach of Amherst. It only right. lasts till the end of December, doesn't it? Yes, yeah. right. That's the yeah. problem. <laughs> That's another reason why I'm not pushing that one. Yeah, I mean, I think it just seems that, um, you know, if raft is going to take several months and if people are falling through the cracks with our program, you know, that the chances, chances are people are still going to be getting evicted or at least at risk of that and, you know, having some sort of just some surefire way of preventing that from happening in this time. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would be open to exploring that further. Okay. Well, again, I have the Somerville order. Um, and so um, we can certainly pass that along to town council if people think that's an appropriate action for us to take. Yes. <laughs> Other comments or thoughts about that? Well, maybe we should also talk to the um, local board of health and see if they can support us in this. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah, we have a new health director um, and she might be interested in this. Emma Dragon. Uh, right, from the little bit of description that I've seen of her, I've never met her. She's great. Well, if you know her, Erica, do you want to talk to her about this? I can send you the summer, the relevant Somerville materials. I or, certainly can. I just have to do it after hours. Right. Because of my role. Yes. Paul, do you have any reservation about our doing that? Oh, you should talk to the health director if, if you want to. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, well, it's interesting. I agree. Like, you know, could, could, I mean, you know, this could have an end date. It could be, you know, it's a term limited moratorium. So it's not, you know, something that, we're trying to enact beyond, you know, for years, it's a, as a, a specific purpose. And so, you know, yeah, I'd be curious to, uh, John, if you sent that Somerville information around just to see, you know, what the nuances are and how it, how it could relate to Amherst. Okay, I'll be glad to do that. Okay, I wanna move on because uh, I wanna get to property acquisition. Um, there are a couple of things that I'll just mention briefly. Yep. Uh, Will, anything new on pending re re legislation? Um, well, I'll just give you a quick, quick update um, for those of you who don't know um, or didn't, didn't follow this, but the, uh, so there was a, a bill, uh, both the Senate, um, sorry, both the Senate and House, House passed budget, uh, fiscal year 2021 budgets uh, that went to reconciliation committee. Um, and uh, basically each, uh, each fiscal year budget um, had various amounts of money for raft and home base, et cetera. Um, but the, uh, the, or the bill that emerged out of, the, out of this conference committee um, had basically all the best parts from both of the versions of the bill. Um, and right now that is before the governor um, and waiting for a signature and he needs to sign it by the 14th of December. So four days from now, um, he has not yet signed it as far as I know. Um, the, uh, basically this, um, this draft bill, uh, this draft budget includes, you know, additional, uh, you know, $24 million for raft and additional $19 million for Massachusetts rental voucher program uh, and an additional $20 million for home base. Um, and you know, added funding basically across the board for all a whole host of housing programs. So all in all, it's pretty good. Chapa really loves it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm inclined to follow their lead. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that, that's kind of where we're at. I think if if there were uh, a action that the trusts could take, um, I, I you know I haven't checked with uh, anybody on the house who would know if this would actually be particularly effective, but we could. Uh, 
drafts a letter to the governor asking, urging him to pass this or, or to sign this particular, uh, this draft of the budget, uh, because it does, it is very strong on affordable housing issues. Um, but I leave that up to, up to the trust, obviously. Thank you. Okay. Um, the other thing that I had, uh, and I know Laura Baker is kind of waiting in the wings, but I'm going to mention this and then see if there's anything she wants to add briefly. Um, if people don't know the news about the status of the Amherst Studio Apartments or 132 Northampton Road couldn't be better. I mean, it could have happened more quickly, but the outcome is exactly what we would have wanted. The Zoning Board of Appeals um, did vote to provide a comprehensive permit to uh, Valley Community Development. And then uh, that was filed with the town clerk. There was a period, I think, of 20 days in which there was a possibility that someone could appeal their decision. That appeal has not occurred. That is, the period ended without anybody appealing, um, all of which is great. And now Valley has a couple of opportunities that they're pursuing for two different funding programs of DHCD, which I think are due in December and January. So, uh, and, and they've received encouragement to pursue that funding. So all of that's really good news um, for that project. I don't know. John, Dave Zomack had raised his hand a minute ago. Oh, okay. Dave? Um, can you hear me, John? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, actually, I'm I'm waiting for your executive session, so my apologies for interrupting. Oh, okay. I might have hit the uh, raise hand button there, but I am here. I've been here the whole time listening, and it's a great conversation. And I'll join you when when the time is right. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, okay, then there were two other requests that I had. Um, a family Outreach of Amherst and Amherst Community Connections both have uh, proposals before the Community Block Grant Development Group. And uh, they both ask that uh, we send letters of support for their applications. I don't have their complete applications because I'm not sure they're complete yet. I did include uh, part of a note that I got from Laura Reichman uh, in an email yesterday in the morning um, that briefly summarized the work that they're doing, which I think we all should be familiar with in any event. Um, so they're continuing to do that work and they need uh, to have the Community Development Block Grant Committee uh, fund their program into the future. So that's they're requesting. And then uh, I won't read what I wrote for Laura, but I will read what I got from uh, Wayling Greeny uh, for uh, Amherst Community Connections. CPAC has voted recently to support uh, ACC's $225,000 funding for supportive housing of six vouchers. This has doubled our capacity to assist those who experience long-term chronic homelessness in our community. However, the CPA funds do not cover uh, the organization's support service provided for the voucher holders to allow them to transition to long-term stable and affordable housing and to achieve financial self-sufficiency. ACC needs the CDBG funding to provide this support service that are crucial to the stability of these participants. Uh, so uh, we have Family Outreach of Amherst asking for funds to continue to work with individuals and families whose housing stability is threatened. Uh, and we have ACC's request. Uh, so does anyone want to move that we send a letter to the Community Development Block Camp Grant Committee in support of both of those applications? I would move that we support both applications. Is there a second? Second. Second. 
Okay, is there any further discussion? Um, okay, so we'll go and do a little vote. Uh, all those in favor will? Yes. Sid? Yes. Paul? Epstein. Carol? Yes. Erica? Yes. Francis? Yes. And I'm also in favor. Okay, so that's dispatched. And that leaves us about a half an hour, I think, to talk about uh, acquiring property. So the, um, John, we still could allow some public comment before we- Oh, sorry. Leave. So just everyone, there's a few members in attend or a few um, public in attendance. So the trust would ha you know, have to vote now to go into executive session, John. So before right? and then that. We would, right, and then, um, but just to make sure we don't have any public comment, we can take that. Okay, if there are any attendees who wanna make a public comment, please raise your hand. Okay, there being none, or at least I think there's none. Uh, yep, okay, then we're ready to move on to executive session. So I move that we close out our regular meeting and then reconvene in two or three minutes into executive session to discuss the, the uh, acquisition of property for affordable housing. We're going into executive session because uh, even though it's a pretty late date, as you'll see, um, we still don't want to talk about the details of this acquisition in public until at least the purchase and sale agreement has been signed. Could I leave this portion of the meeting? Yeah, we're going to, um, there's a new link. We'll yeah, start yeah. a new meeting. So this actually meeting will end and then there'll be a new meeting. That's a new Zoom meeting for the executive session. Thank you. So all those in favor of ending our regular meeting? You need to do a roll call vote. Oh, okay. Uh, Erica? Uh, yes. I'm yes. Paul? Yes. Sid? Yes. Francis? Yes. Carol? Yes. Will? Yes. Okay, I think that gives us a unanimous vote. So, and then uh, just and to verify, has everyone, did everyone receive the email I sent earlier with the, uh, yes, okay. Did anybody not receive it? Okay, then we're all set to move into the next session. Thank you very much, all. <laughs>